They roused him with muffins, they roused him with ice, they roused him with mustard and cress, they roused him with jam and judicious advice, they set him conundrums to guess. When at length he sat up and was able to speak, his sad story he offered to tell. And the bellman cried, Silence, not even a shriek, and excitedly tingled his bell. There was silence supreme, not a shriek, not a scream, scarcely even a howl or a groan. As the man they called, Ho, oh, told his story of woe, in an antedilivian tone. My father and mother were honest though poor. Skip all that, cried the bellman in haste. If it once becomes dark, there is no chance of a snog, with hardly a minute to waste. I skip forty years, said the baker in tears, and proceed without further remark to the day when you took me aboard of your ship to help you in hunting the snog. A dear uncle of mine, after whom I was named, remarked when I bade him farewell. Oh, skip, you dear uncle, the bellman exclaimed as he angrily tingled his bell. He remarked to me then, said the mildest of men, if your snog be a snog that is right, fetch it home by all means, you may serve it with greens, and it's handy for striking a light. You may seek it with thimbles, and seek it with care, you may hunt it with forks, and hope. You may threaten its life with a railway share, you may charm it with smiles and soap. That's exactly the method, the bellman bold in a hasty parenthesis cried. That's exactly the way I have always been told that the capture of snarks should be tried. But oh, beamish nephew, beware of the day, if your snark be about tomb, for then you will softly and suddenly vanish away, and never be met with again. It is this, it is this that oppresses my soul, when I think of my uncle's last words, and my heart is like nothing so much as a bowl, brimming over with quivering curds. It is this, it is this, we have had that before, the bellman indignantly said. And the baker replied, let me say it once more, it is this, it is this that I dread. I engage with the snug every night of the dark, in a dreamy delirious fight. I serve it with greens in those shadowy scenes, and I use it for striking a light. But if I ever meet with a tomb that day, in a moment, of this I am sure, I shall softly and suddenly vanish away, and the notion I cannot endure. The bellman looked affish and wrinkled his brow. If only you'd spoken before. It's excessively awkward to mention it now, with the snark so to speak at the door. We should all of us grieve, as you well may believe, if you were never met with again. But surely, my man, when the voyage began, you might have suggested it then. It's excessively awkward to mention it now, as I think I've already remarked. And the man they called, hey, replied with a sigh. I informed you the day we embarked. You may charge me with murder or want of sense. We are all of us weak at times, but the slightest approach to a false pretense was never among my crimes. I said it in Hebrew, I said it in Dutch, I said it in German and Greek. But I wholly forgot, and it vexes me much, that English is what you speak. Tis a pitiful tale, said the bellman, whose face had grown longer at every word. But now that you've stated the whole of your case, more debate would be simply absurd. The rest of my speech, he explained to his man, you shall hear when a lesser to speak it. But a snark is at hand, let me tell you again, tis your glorious duty to seek it. To seek it with thimbles, to seek it with care, to pursue it with forks and hope, to threaten its life with a railway share, to charm it with smiles and soap. For the snark's a peculiar creature that won't be caught in a commonplace way. Do all that you know and draw all that you don't, not a chance must be wasted today. For England expects, I forbear to proceed, tis a maxim tremendous but trite, and you'd best be unpacking the things that you need to rig yourself out for the fight. Then the banker endorsed the blank check which he crossed, and changed his loose silver for notes. The baker with care combed his whiskers and hair, and shook the dust out of his coats. The boots and the broker were sharpening a spade, each working the grindstone in turn. But the beaver went on making lace and displayed no interest in the concern. Though the barrister tried to appeal to its bride and vainly proceeded to cite a number of cases in which making laces had been 
proved an infringement of right. The maker of bonnets ferociously bland a novel arrangement of bows, while the billiard maker with quivering hands was chalking the tip of his nose. But the butcher turned nervous and dressed himself fine, with yellow kit gloves and a ruff. Said he felt it exactly like going to dine, which the bellman declared was all stuff. Introduce me now, there's a good fellow, he said, if we happen to meet it together. And the bellman sagaciously nodded his head, said, That must depend on the weather. The beaver went simply galumphing about at seeing the butcher so shy, and even the baker, though stupid and stout, made an effort to wink with one eye. Be a man, said the bellman in wrath as he heard the butcher beginning to sob. Should we met with a chap-chap, this desperate bird? We shall need all our strength for the job. 